All right, this is a video for module 23 about money. So pretty much this is the, all we're going to talk about with uh, module 23. Um, basically, uh, we need to talk about the functions of money, the role of money, the types of money, and how we define the money supply. So first of all, money as a whole has to fit three roles in order to, for it to actually function as money. First of all, it has to have a medium of exchange. In other words, it has to be a way to get goods and services. So, you know, I get, um, I make bread, for example, I sell my bread, I get money, which then I can then use to buy, for example, this large piece of meat. Um, but the intention here with a medium of exchange is, is that this is um, this piece of paper, and it's actually made out of cotton and linen, um, can be um, used to be able to pay me for, uh, you know, selling my bread as well as be able to get other things. We all agree that it works. We all agree on it, so it works as money. If we wanted to change um, our money, our type of money, it would be, have to, again, be something that everyone agreed on. It couldn't just be some random thing. The second role of money is it has to have a store of value, meaning that if I go and put this um, in a vault someplace and lock it up for 30 years, can I go and take it out in 30 years and be able to use it? Yeah, you could. Okay. Um, there's stories of people from uh, the Great Depression era uh, where they didn't trust banks at the time, so what did they do with their money? They put it under the mattress, they buried it in the backyard. Um, and so what happened was is that uh, sometimes there's stories decades later of people buying these old houses and you know they're puttering around in their backyard they're gonna you know plant this hydrangea bush or whatever and they go digging around and ding ding ding. All of a sudden, you hit this, uh, you know, tin of money that, oh my gosh, you open it up, you're like, oh, there's like $200 in here. Um, could you spend it? Yes, yes, you could, okay? Uh, it doesn't happen very much anymore, but there occasionally are stories where, you know, people find old money. It's still good. It still works. It's just old money. Okay. Um, money also has to have what we call a unit of account. What we mean by this is, is it has to have a measurement of value. So you have to be able to understand what this means. So for example, um, I gave the example in class of I have um, some really heavy bookends that I got at a Renaissance festival um, for 20 bucks and it was two of them. So two of them together, I paid $20. It's really heavy rock, right? It's kind of pretty looking or anything. But I tell you, I spent $20 on bookends and this, you know, this big rock, these two big rocks, and people look at me like I'm crazy. Well, why? Because you understand what the value of $20 is, right? However, if have, have you ever actually attempted to buy a bookend, a heavy bookend? I mean, I'm trying to keep up textbooks here, so these are not lightweight books. Uh, so here's the thing is, is that if you go and check out other bookends, maybe you would find that my $20 bookends are actually quite cheap. So it changes your perspective. But money is a unit of account. When I say something costs $20, you understand what that means. All right. So this all evolved into types of money. So we kind of have this little story of this evolution of money. So it started off way, way back when. We used to not even have money and we had the bartering system. So we would just, you know, argue back and forth to trade something, right? So I want your water bottle. What do I have that you would be willing to trade me for it, right? Well, then it got to be the point where people started to realize, okay, this is A, time consuming. Um, and B, there's no standard to it. There's no standard of value. So, you know, you could argue uh, with me about your water bottle and you could get some really valuable thing for your water bottle, but somebody else would say, hey, I'll give it to you for, you know, I don't know, a piece of cheese, whatever. So the point is, is that eventually it evolved to we needed money. So the first type of money was called commodity money. And commodity money is basically anything that's used as money that has, has a value by itself. So lots of examples of things that have been used as commodity money. Gold has been used as commodity money. Rice has been used as commodity money. Salt. Um, cacao beans, so like the um, beans that are used to make chocolate. Um, cigarettes in prisons. Okay, These are all things that by themselves, they have value. You, they could use them for a variety of purposes, but they're being used to actually trade for things. Okay, so. Here's the thing though, if you think about it, okay, let's use the extreme case of salt here. Think about trying to use salt as money. 
picture that, if you will. You probably can see a, a bunch of problems with using salt as money. Number one, okay, um, salt and rice and even gold, these are things that are found in, the, in nature that you could make more of, or maybe, for example, in gold, you could have a hard time getting more of. So that's going to create a problem, okay? Number two, if it has a purpose by itself, maybe, for example, I don't want to go and use salt as money. Maybe I want to use salt as a preservative for the meat, okay? I don't want to use it. Uh, or maybe what happens is just think of the logistics of trying to carry around a bunch of salt and trying to pay for stuff with that. And then you have to have obviously some sort of measurement of it to be able to pay for things. Who's to say your measurement is the same as you know the guy that you're buying it from? There's a whole bunch of problems. As well as just carrying around salt. The portability factor alone is annoying. So eventually what happened is, is that um, people got smart. They started realizing, okay, obviously things, most things by that point were gold that we were using as money. Um, they said, okay, this is getting ridiculous. I mean, it's heavy to carry around gold and, you know, I keep getting robbed and all this other stuff. So they said, how about this? How about I go put it in a safe place, i.e. a bank, uh, and then the bank will go and write out little slips of paper for me and says how much gold I actually have in the bank. So then when I go to the uh, pay for things at the store, I can give them one of these little slips of paper that says, you now have this much of the gold that I used to have in the bank, right? That's what we call commodity backed money. It's paper money, it's actual paper money that could be exchanged for the actual commodity, in this case, gold. Um, fun fact, by the way, um, the largest bill ever produced in the United States was a gold certificate, um, which is a commodity backed money. Basically, it's a, a paper money that you could exchange for gold. The largest um, gold certificate was a $100,000 bill. And yes, that is a picture of Woodrow Wilson on it. Um, it was not used in, um, you know, it was, the public did not use this. Um, it was for bank transfers between banks. So this, this was not by the public because obviously the public at that point in time did not have $100,000. Uh, so here's the thing is that commodity backed money solved the problem of that whole portability issue and transferring things. Uh, but because it was still tied to, for example, gold, it still had problems because if I wanted to print more gold, what would I need? I'm sorry, if I wanted to print more, more, commodity back money, more gold certificates, I'd need more gold, right? Sometimes I wouldn't be able to find more gold, okay? Or maybe the value of gold, maybe there's a ton of gold out there. So then the value of my gold certificate is, you know, teeny tiny because there's so much gold out there. But I don't want the value of my money tied to value how much gold I can find in the ground. So then they started to get smart and they said, okay, let's, let's, let's back this up. Why do we even need this paper money to represent anything. Why can't it just be money by itself? Ah, now we're getting into fiat money. Fiat money is going to be paper money that has value because the government says so, and we believe that it works, okay? Our money today is actually fiat money. There is nothing backing our money today at all. The only reason that it works is because we believe that it works. Okay. The minute we have enough people that don't agree on it, and for example, going back to those rolls of money, and they agree and they say, no, nope, I don't want to use it for a medium of exchange. No, nope, I don't like it anymore. Then all of a sudden that fiat money is worthless. Case in point, you probably remember from U.S. history, the Revolutionary War, the uh, beginnings of the U.S. government tried to fund the war through U.S. continental dollars. They tried to get people to use them. Nobody wanted to use them. Why? Because they didn't trust the government. There was nothing backing it, and they said it's just money because you say it is? Well, who's to say you're going to be around in 10 years? I don't know. So as a result, that didn't work. So fiat money is totally based on the trust of the people. So keep that in mind. All right, last slide that I want to talk about is money aggregates. In other words, measures of the money supply. How do we know how much money is actually out there in the world? Well, money is actually... Um, measured um, by, if we're talking about, there's two different categories, M1 and M2. M1 is the narrowest definition of money. So the narrowest definition of money is literally the currency in circulation, so counting out how much cash there is in this big pile, right? Cash, 
um, coins, obviously, but it's also including something called checkable deposits. Checkable deposits are going to be those accounts that you could go to, for example, the ATM and get cash out of, or you could go and write a check for. It is money because I could go to a store and use my debit card or write a check and I can walk out with goods and services. Okay, so M1 is going to include basically just the currency, so actual cash in hand, and checkable deposits. That's it, that's M1. Now, here's the thing though, is, is that M2 is taking into account, okay, well, you probably, like myself, have both a savings account and a checking account. Why do you do that, by the way? Savings account and checking account. Checking account, I can write a check or I can use my debit card. Savings account, I, I have nothing, no access to it directly. It's not like I can go into my local grocery store and take in my savings account book. I don't think they even give out books anymore. A savings account book and say, here, you can take the money out of my savings account. No. They're going to want you to, to actually transfer it over to your checking account. Why do you have the savings account in the first place? Because the savings account pays you interest on your money. Checking accounts pay you no interest. So it's in your best interest to be able to put most of your money in your savings account and slowly move it over to your checking account as you need it. So this is why we call M2 is including M1, so all of that stuff that we just talked about, the currency and circulation, checkable deposits, but it also including something called near money. This is stuff that can be easily turned into cash, such as savings accounts or CDs. CDs are certificates of deposit. So they have to be something that I can quick turn into cash. You know, um, I don't have a whole lot of money in my checking account right now. Oh, wait, I have money in my savings account. Click, click, click on the mouse. All of a sudden, I have money in my checking account. All I did was just move it from my savings to my checking. That's it. That's near money. So near money, uh, think of near money as, uh, so money is this liquid, okay, so like the water. Near money is stuff that is frozen, okay, so think of frozen ice cubes, but it can be thawed very quickly and turned into money. Now, here's the thing, though, is, is that um, keep in mind, there's, um, you can also talk about uh, money in you know, your savings account and a bank vault someplace. Um, keep in, or a certificate of deposit. Keep in mind, this does not, does not include things like stocks and bonds. Stocks and bonds are not money. They are investments, okay? They take a little bit more time to be able to turn into cash. They are uh, not even near money. Okay, they are investments, they are assets that you have. You can sell an asset just like you could sell your car, you could sell your bike, you could sell your old baseball cards in the attic. Okay, They are investments, they are assets that you could turn into money, but it is not money. Okay, That's the biggest thing that I saw wrong with people's homework is that they were telling me stocks and bonds are near monies. Uh-uh, they are not. Okay, Things like savings accounts are near money. Okay, hopefully that cleared everything up. Let me know if you have any questions.